Test, test. Okay, wonderful. Are you ready, Jeffrey? I'm live. All right. Thank you all for coming this evening. My name is Barbara Peters. I'm the owner of the Poison Pen, and I'm delighted to welcome back Tim Dorsey. And I just went and checked, and his last appearance here was with Trigger Fish Twist in what year? That would have been 2002. That's exactly right. 2002. So it's been 15 years. Wow. Wow. How about that? Anyway, we're thrilled to have you back. Um, and you're on some kind of really extensive tour with this book, right? Yes. Yeah, you have to use the microphone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's how you. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's fifty-seven stops. And uh, wow. Yeah. And my question is, why? You know, why this particular book? Why 57 stops? Or is that normal and we just happen to get into the queue this time? No, that's that, that's normal. I mean, my longest was, uh, I think in 2005, it was 76 stops. Uh -huh. uh, but so, yeah, we've kind of peeled back. But it's it's a lot of Florida. It's a lot of mainly driving. Uh, I try to avoid the airlines. It's, it's like they're like subways in the sky now. And, uh, but uh, yeah, you'll miss a lot of events due to you know, airline flying. So I, I try to road trip as much as possible. It's a long road trip from Florida to Arizona. I wouldn't have done that. I flew. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're thrilled to have you. And I also want to point out to you, if you hold up the cover of the book, that you will see that Tim has dressed to match it. I mean, I we don't get that too often that the author is color coordinated with the book, but I think it's that's what my awesome. fold up suit thing is in my in my uh, in my, uh, uh, my luggage is all tropical shirts. There's no jacket, no no other shirts. are just that. So, uh, so yeah. is this a rare stop on your tour where you don't have to wear a jacket over your coat? This is the very first stop I haven't worn a jacket. So he well, has a good in. day. If you'd no. been here Tuesday, you would have been wearing your jacket or possibly even a raincoat. Yeah, no, I mean, I came, I started for national tour. I started in Denver and then Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, and it's been even Los Angeles. It was cold, and the thing is, people make fun of Floridians, and this doesn't make fun of Los Angeles, but um, you know, it's like the least little coolness we bundle up. It's like I just had, I was just like this, and I just had a jacket on, light, light jacket, and people are wearing like down parkas with the hoods up and. And I mean scarves, and I mean it, it looked like Boston in the winter. I mean it was ridiculous. So anyway, we have to take advantage. Those of us who have winter clothes, you know, we only get like six days a year to wear them, so you have to pull them out. So Tim, which book was Triggerfish Twist? Was it number? That was the fourth. Okay, um, Surge Storms come a long way in all this time. Is he is he just kind of evolved as you as he's evolved, or did you have a plan for him all along? I, I don't have a plan, and people mention different things, and he's changed in certain ways, and I guess it's just how I've changed or whatever mood I'm in when I write a particular book. You know, people have, like, really pissed me off a lot. He's a little more violent, and <laughs> everything's going well. Then, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's weird, the, the reactions I get uh, to Surge. Um, it's, oh, it goes both ways. No, no one, one is sometimes, you know, I was disappointed. There, there weren't enough murders in this book, you know. <laughs> I, I don't keep count, and then, and then one guy I won't say where, but you know you can read online. And somebody gave me like a one star reviews, and this is strange because, especially, but it happens every book. And uh, I actually like my bad reviews because they're more entertaining. Because, it, well, it's now that anybody can do a review, it's usually like a Rorschach test to see what's going on in their lives that's wrong. <laughs> like, but like, how much can one book be different from the others? Unless you really kind of. So, anyway, this one review said that I loved every book up until this one, but, but this one, you know, I hated. And one of the main reasons right off the bat was the second murder. You know, this is the 20th book. The, the second murder in the book, you know, was totally uncalled for. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> the first 19 books of it, right on. No, no they're all wrong. Murder, Murder's wrong. It's, but yeah, he was okay. He was okay with all. Right, Serge. Well, he finally he finally crossed the line, you know, <laughs> with the, the 212th murder. So anyway, anyway, um, Florida is kind of a, a a place where incidents and stuff for plots just naturally arises, right? Do you have to make up a lot of stuff, or do you just read the paper and there it is? No, you you don't have to make up virtually anything. And the problem that I have is is I've become desensitized uh, to. Because I, it's in my job. I've got to notice these things and write them down. And the thing is, it's kind of like, you know, our export, chief export, you know, used to be citrus, and now it's weird headlines. I mean, we we have a stereotype in the nation, you know, the talk show host at night, 
about you know either Florida or Florida Man or whatever. And uh, when I started the books, it was more of, more toward the Miami Vice kind of a Casablanca, you know, crime ridden or whatever. But it's kind of gotten weirder and weirder. Um, but like if a uh, headline comes out of Florida, you know, you guys will notice it. You'll see it. It'll go on the wire. Everybody like, oh, another crazy Florida. But um, but I like I I don't notice it. It seems normal. No, it seems normal to me. Like I was, I actually missed the readers sent me a bunch of emails. So, but I was like reading the paper, and you probably read this headline. It was down around toward Miami, and um, and a guy uh, guy went through the. It was Wendy's. He went through the drive-through lane, and he just pulled up to the. Uh, you know, you know, the window, threw a three-foot alligator through the window and took off. You know, I'm re <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, didn't order, just went right up, the alligator in. So, you know, I read that in the paper, and I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, just turn the paper. It, it's, no, I mean, stuff like a guy burglarized a house, and then cops came, so he hid, it was a lakefront house, and he hid in the water at night up to his eyeballs like this, right, and the alligator ate him. I mean... It's just a, it's just a constant drumbeat of stuff, and I don't even have to read the papers. Um, I had my books already printed, and I had my case, my personal cases, in my living room. I was about a week before leaving for the tour. My wife came home. Like I said, we don't even need the paper. You just go outside, and you have a novel. Um, she came home and said um, that uh, she had to take a detour. That like the southbound lanes of it's the main drag through Tampa, connecting it's Dale Mabry. Because yeah, all the you know the four like southbound lanes were all closed down, because this naked guy kept running across the hoods of cars and up on the roofs and jumping around and everything, and like that's already in this book. And I go, what did he get an early copy? You know, <laughs> it's like the books can't come out fast enough because reality will leapfrog you. It'll you know, it's, that's the challenge in Florida. Does it matter? I mean, I know you're in Tampa. We've read, you know, Daybury's down in Miami. John Sanford was once taught, he, when he was writing in Miami, he and Edna Buchanan were like deskmates or something. And they would just see stuff, you know, that was made for a novel to come in. But does it matter where in Florida you are, or is it just like Florida? Because you said surge on, you know, jaunts. It, it, it does matter a certain degree. Um, South Florida. But both coasts and everything. And like, well, like, I'll give you an example. Dave Barry, I don't know, that new book, Best State Ever. Have you seen that? He, he wrote a book, you know, Best State yeah. Ever, which is a reaction to all this. And he wrote essays. And usually, you know, he'll be at home and he'll write, you know, uh, humorous essays about, uh, you know, raising kids or turning 50 or 60 or whatever. And, he, and he'll write those. But um, this one, he called, and I was very proud because he was one of my heroes before I, when I was not even published. And uh, I, w I saw him at the 97 World Series, which I was working for. I was working on Florida Roadkill, but I was unpublished, and I didn't know if I'd ever get published. And I ran up to him. He was, like, you know, in the liquor line or whatever, and I, and I, I grabbed a pen off someone, and I had my World Series ticket, and I ran up, Dave, Dave, Dave. And then, you know, kind of, like, startled a little sec, because I ran up. I was su such a spaz. And, and, it, and I said, can you sign my ticket? And he signed the ticket. And so I put that in Florida Roadkill. I said, Serge runs up to him, and then, you know, Dave kind of jumps back and Serge says, I didn't know Dave Barry had a nervous condition. You know, and, and so I put that in the first book, and then I had Dave Barry sign it in the first Miami book before I went to. But come full circle, um, in, in this book that just came out this summer, um, uh, or, or no, actually not this summer, a couple months ago, um, on the acknowledgment page, the very first line is he thanks me. He goes, I thank Tim Dorsey, who knows more about weird Florida than anybody. Which that'll be my tombstone. That's my legacy. I'm I'm, t I'm tuned into the to the off center, but he he got a hold of me and he said he explained, you know, the book that he was going to have written, uh, or that the publisher wanted him to to have written, and it, where he'd have to like travel around the state. And he goes, I know Miami pretty well, but can you you know point out you know various places around you know that are really weird you know and because. And you know, if anybody would know. So I gave him this list, and then he went and did the book, and then I, I you very graciously sent me the, uh, the copy. Um, but one of the places, and I ran into him at the Miami Book Fair, and because he got up from his desk and did what I do for my books, which is travel around to these strange places in Florida, you know, I bumped into him, you know, before uh, one of the sessions, and I went up to him and I said, uh, I said, I bet you had more fun writing this book. And he goes, it was a blast. You know, you travel around, and you, and he really got into it. And he said, one of the places that I had uh, suggested he go to, 
in Florida, everybody knows this. For a lot of people know it. But it's a town called Casadega, and it's it's between Daytona Beach and and Orlando, and it's off the interstate, kind of out. And it's a town consisting entirely of psychics. No, I'm not joking. If you go you go into this town, and it was founded like in the early 1900s by spiritualist mediums or whatever. And you go into the town, and there is not one other business. Everything's a psychic shop. You know, they're selling different. And they have, you know, different um, specialties: past life regression, and astrology, and palm reading, and and lucky crystals, and this and that. Then they have the main headquarters where you go in, and there's like a there's like a, a whiteboard that says who's on duty. You know, by category of what they are. There's a phone you can call it, whatever. And so it is. It's but it's weird. It's not just because they're psychics. It's like there's not a gas station, not a convenience store, not. You know, it'd be like going into a town, and every store is like a yogurt shop. Everything is so. So Dave, Dave said, "Yeah, I went to Casadega," and he says, "And I got, I got this angry letter from some psychic I interviewed, saying, you know, and she was really upset that we portrayed her in the wrong light, and and that you know, we made fun of the whole thing and everything, you know." And I'm like, you know, she's a psychic. Didn't see that coming, you know. It's, 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 anyway. There seems to be an unusually high incidence of people in journalism who, in Florida, who have taken to writing novels. Um, is there is there a causal connection, or is it just because you keep running across all the stories, or why? I mean, I, there really are a lot of Floridians. There's the odd lawyer or whatever, um, but most of the authors I know that are in Florida were journalists or are still journalists. That, that's yeah, you got Carl, Dave, you got Randy, um, you got Ed Buchanan. Um, me, I mean, it's and Jonathan King, remember? Yeah, Jonathan um, King yeah, from the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel. Moment, yep. but he's another one. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's well, it's like, I guess, I mean, the the answer, you know, it, it, it's uh, it's just you see it, you know, you see it every day. You read, you know, so it, it's no surprise, you know, because um, people say, you know, what's with how crazy all the writers write down there, and I'm like, look at who you're talking about, all journalists, you know. They're not. It's not imagination. Carl actually says, that you take from the paper, and you have to actually have to subtract imagination from reality, because reality would, you know. And, and I don't. I put. I actually put the weirdest stuff in straight up, and those are the things that people will. And I, I'm, I'm mischievous that way, because you know, it'll get pointed out. You know, like that one part was too over the top, or that's where we went just too far. It's like it's not funny when it's too, you know, trying too hard. And I'm like, nope, it was real. Happened. You know. <laughs> So what happens in Clownfish Blues, or at least what's the setup? The, well, the setup is, um, I actually had a reader, and I get, I get a lot of great emails from readers, and uh, it was, um, I didn't know this, and I wouldn't have even thought about it, and they actually had to specifically state it um, in the promotional material, was well, Serge always likes road tripping, right? And so he gets hung up on the TV show, um, uh, <laughs> Route 60, yeah, it, the whole book is about it. And, uh, so, so, so he gets he gets hung up on the TV show Route, Route 66. You remember that black and white early 60s? So, um, you know, because it, it matches the road tripping stuff. But the reason is, and he, he explains this, um, I thought, you know, okay, Route 66, it was a little bit before my time, but I remember Martin Milner and Adam 12 when I was a little old, when I was an older child. But... Um, the uh, you know it's like okay you know the mother road Chicago to Los Angeles and so they they started there. Well, what I didn't know is that what they did is as as the show became more popular and they branched out, it became less of like a linear geographical label uh, and more of a state of mind. You know, all you're on the road, freedom, go to a new town or whatever. So they started going to other parts of the country, and it was four seasons. In the end of the third season, there were two episodes, and then like half or more of the fourth season. Film in Florida, entire you know, and it was like the the end of the series, the end of the entire series was a you know, double episode in Tampa, where I live. You know, it was, it was just nuts. And um, and that last, I guess it's like you know, hey, we made a lot of money. You know, we're uh, we're we're top of the ratings. You know, we can tell them wherever. You know, let, let's tell them we want to film in Florida. You know, so so there's all these. So I immediately went out and I grabbed uh, the DVD collection, and they were like these fantastic. I mean the the plots were so hokey, but the cinematography was on location. It was one, I think it was one of the first TV shows shot, you know, on location around the country. And 
I mean, this is footage you, you cannot find capturing different locales in Florida. Wiki Watchy with the mermaids and South Tampa with the highlight fronton and everything. And it was so anyway. So he he gets all excited about that, and then they start doing their own episodes. And he explains that you have to go to a new town each week and get a new job, you know, and then you know, and then quit the job and go on and whatever. And then he talks about talks about the sex because he says, you know, if there's ever like a divorcee in a town, you knew it was going down, you know, whatever. You know, Lincoln, Todd, you know, one of them had to have sex in each town with somebody. And Coleman, and well, that was that was the first one. Yeah, no, Link replaced him in the Florida episodes. Yes, but you do know your your show. Uh, <laughs> But, but anyway, so the point was, Goldman says, I, I watch your DVDs. I never saw any sex. And he goes, well, it was, it was the times. You know, it was during the commercials. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you're dedicated, it's more than enough time. And so. so the spine of the book is basically the road trip? Basically them doing that. And then there's other stuff going on. It has to do with the Florida lottery. And, uh, and I, I had a lot of stories that I remembered from the newspaper about the lottery that isn't the traditional stories. You know, like people use it for money laundering. They buy winning tickets at a premium, and hey, I just spent a buck, and here's whatever, and it cleans it. And then there's other things that uh, underhanded convenience stores are misreading tickets and this and that. And uh, But the one story that never got any traction, and I was surprised because I thought it was one of the most fascinating stories about the lottery, was it was, I think it was back in the 90s when I was on the, on the Metro desk. And back then, they've actually increased it, but back then, each jackpot would start out at $7 million. And there were 14 million possible number combinations for that. That's what the lottery was in Florida. I was good with math, so I could, well, if it rolls over and it gets up to like 100 million, right? So these vet, this actually happened, and it was a tiny little story. And I never heard anything. I never heard anybody talk about it. I just read it. And um, these like venture capitalists came in, they went to the they went to the lottery uh, commission or whatever, and so we want to buy the whole board. We want to here's fourteen million dollars. We want to buy all fourteen million numbers. They said we don't do that because it would it would discourage the individual player. So what they did was, and I don't know how they did this because it wasn't really explained, but they hired a whole bunch of people, and they went, and they only had a week to do it, and they went and they. They went to all the convenience stores and all the supermarkets to buy up every number they could. And they gave everybody a set, like, okay, you do this thousand, you do this. And they ended up getting, like, it was 14 million. They got, like, 10 million numbers, right? That's nail-biting time because they didn't get the whole 14, so now you get 10 million. <laughs> but, uh, but they won. They still they won. The winning ticket was of, like, the 10 million. And I don't know how in one week you could... You know, like starting from scratch. No, we won't sell you the board. Okay, well, let's go and do it ourselves. How would you buy up that many tickets? So, so I thought that was a, I thought that was an amazing story, and uh, I folded that into, you know, this book. So. so you've been writing a long series, but it sounds like you don't really have to go looking for plots. You just kind of assemble stuff and then shape it into something. How does it work? That's 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 it's a lot of books, you know. It's a lot you of books written about one person. So I usually I keep I keep a uh, I keep a file, just a regular word processing, you know, and it just has bullet items of different ideas and things that I've I've read about or picked up, and um, and then usually I'll come up with a main idea for the next book, and I'll see well what what can work with that, you know, and what what additional characters do I still have out there, and what what have I you know, and so. I'll I'll go through that list and I'll highlight which things would make a good fit for for the next book. But yeah, I mean I got the next two ideas already. I had one idea and then one came to me while I was driving, uh, and it just totally fleshed out in the course of about 15 minutes. And so, well, but I mean, you got more work than that. But I mean, I kind of I saw I saw the beginning of it, and I go, what if somebody did this, or what if some, you know, accountant or somebody tripped over this little fact, and then and then he tells somebody about it, or he tells his superiors, and then people, and you know, he doesn't know what he's, anyway. So it has this whole arc about him getting in trouble about something, anyway. I asked because it comes up a lot and came up last night in an event we did about, you know, if you're writing a long-term series, how do you stay interested in your character? And if you get bored, you know, readers get bored, and then maybe you'd rather write something else. And somehow that's never seemed to me to be a problem for you. 
Well, I can I can answer it like like this. Uh, I don't know it's, it's good uh, good comment. Um, basically, if you look at the books, I have ensemble casts, and people ask about would you ever think of writing a non-search book or a different type of book, and you know you could, but you know I'm still interested because he speaks for Florida. Readers are still interested, and so as long as those things are, are in tandem, I mean, I wouldn't phone it in, like, if the readers were interested, but I'm bored to death with it, and then it, it would show in the writing. Uh, but uh, but anyway, what I do with the ensemble cast is, um, if you look in any particular book, Serge is in less than 50% of the pages or chapters. If you, He's like, it's like spicy food. It goes a long way. But the ensemble cast and other things that are going on, Take up you know more than fifty percent if you if you go through them, and in so within the books and within the series, I am departing from the series if you know what I'm saying. In other words, I'll write stories like a Coke and a Cowboy. I won't go into too much de detail, but that family that moves into that small town and he's a geologist, that was a separate story written a separate way, and it was you know so within. You know, you read about Sergeant Coleman's antics, and then you, you know, every other chapter you go and you see this other story, you know, developing. So that's kind of how I've kept it fresh. And plus, you know, I'm in a position where I think a lot of people would miss Serge if he wasn't in a book. But if he's, you know, after this many books, people, and I've been doing this from the beginning, so it kind of helped out, that people maybe want to see a little bit of variety. So they get that with the other players in the, like I said, in the ensemble. Yes. And he, and he rededicates his life every five minutes, I guess. Well, yeah, he's such a free spirit. He's not weighted down with pets and, you know, all those kind of things that can happen. I have one more question I wanted to ask you before we open it up to questions for the audience. Tell us about your titles. Do you think them up? Does your publisher think them up? Um, they're really fun and they're interesting. Uh, I, I, I think them up. I mean, I just uh, sometimes I have them. You know, this one I had the title way before the book. I mean, this was just sitting around because um, uh, I, I have, like, lists of titles or title words. Um, sometimes it's after the fact. I'll finish the book, um, and I don't have a good title. My working title isn't working. Um, so, but, yeah, they're, they're my titles, and then they go do the covers based on them, and they're, they're looking good. Well, they do, and I mean, you can always tell one of his books, right? When you see it, I mean, it's just—I think it's a wonderful. The art department has a has a good ride with you, with bright colors and oh. you know, fun words and the whole bit. It works out extremely well. Do any of you have questions? I know you were all talking before we started this, but chime in. Uh, the No Name Pub on Big Pine Key, down in the Florida Keys. It is. It is. It's, and it's not that divey. I mean, but it's, it's this rustic roadhouse. Back when you had to like get there by canoe or by boat, you know, back back in the Keys from the 30s. So, I was gonna say, you you knew the answer before you asked the question, right? Yeah. Maybe he's a lawyer. Yeah, go, see, no, go check it out. I mean, it's on. Um, you know, it, the, the, it's got a website. It's got a lot of pictures. A lot of fans. They used to just have that little nailed up wooden sign nailed to a tree, hand painted, you know, no name pub, but now people are finding it and the whole the whole allure, it's like it's you know, it's one of those things where it's like basically it's so hard to get to and so hard to find that people make a point of it and it's kind of the reward of you know Yeah, yeah. And and it and if you ask any locals you have a map you can find it. But but yeah, when you're doing the keys you're just going down US one and this one you got to go way back into the mangrove country and, and, and find it. So, but yeah, that, that's 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 number one with a bullet. I actually uh, both, but you know, I, I think about um, you know, I go online and there's some things that talk about noir. You know, the the noir speak from like Mickey Spillane and Dashiell Hammett and all this stuff. But that's, I mean, people actually like uh, Mahoney a lot. And, uh, but it's, it really is hard to keep up the quality and, and keep him, you know, speaking, you know, that way. Oh, I, I, yeah, but I mean, they're, they're the longest, as far as time, the longest it takes me to write something. I mean, if I've got, if I've got Mahoney for a page, you know, that's, disproportionate by far 
and it's interesting. Different characters have different constituencies. There's some like sitting country, and some like I'll tell you. There's one thing that I did. Um, there's Johnny Vegas, the accidental version. People like the um, it was his sexy Latin playboy, but things don't work out. It's always something Florida, but I was aging my characters in real time. You know when I because you know when you write your first book, you know who who can see twenty books, right? So. So it was like the, the World Series in 97, and then the next book, they're a year older, and then a year older. You know, okay, it was a short period of time. But I finally decided I got to freeze their ages. You know, cause like Charlie Brown is like 85 years old, and he's still a little kid. With So, but I, I, was, I was reading stuff on the Internet. You know, you read bulletin boards and people who, you know, post stuff. You know, you, know, you get feedback and see how you're doing. And, um, and I was on this one. They were talking about Johnny Vegas. And this uh, this young woman said, "Yeah, but how could Johnny Vegas be sexy? He's 40." I'm like, oh, <laughs> man, just break the arrow off, push it through, you know. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, possibly, yeah. His Molly, his ex-wife, he was talking about. Because Serge is impolitic. I mean, he's not rude or whatever, but he's he's just uh, you know when it comes to like relationships or whatever, he just he's not being argumentative. He's just like you know, Col <laughs> yeah. Coleman comes over and messes up the guest towels, and he goes, and she's like, and then they're they're having an argument, and and Serge is clueless, and, he, and she's like, you know, well, he messed up my guest towels. You know, what what's he doing using the guest towels? And he goes, well, they're, he's a guest. And he goes, and then she, and she goes, they're the guest towels. And I go, what am I not understanding here? Oh, you don't even want to try. You know? So, it's just like, you know. Well, I, 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 I put in a lot of my marital oafishness of my own. <laughs> Because you know, it's like you, you just step in stuff, and yeah, it's my fault. But yeah, you, you're not doing anything. You're not being a bad person. You just, you know, you know, you, you, women thank you for trying to housebreak us. It's it's never a complete job, but you know, we're just kind of sasquatches with shoes. But but uh, yeah, I had I had one where, and like my wife would be the first one to read the book, so I'll put in all this stuff. But you know, in the books, I can you know. And then you know, she'll, she'll be reading in bed, and I'll be doing whatever, reading or TV, and she'll like. I could see her head turn out the corner of my eye, and she goes, very funny. You know, so, she... so we're all used to Serge A. Storms as a name now, but what is the genesis of his name? I mean, he's, there, there aren't that many characters with the middle initial. If you, I mean, we have Reacher, right, or Harry Bosch or something, but Serge A. Storms, it's always the full thing. Yeah, I just, uh, well, I mean, I just, you know, like, the high, they, <laughs> this is, sarcasm you know the highest form of humor is a pun you know so it was like a storm surge you know so so that's yeah, but you could have called him anything so why did you decide you know way back at the beginning well i, I you know I, I needed a usual name and i had an insurance agent named surge so i go that's a name and so i figured well if his first name is surge and his last name has to be storms because that's my sister-in-law's maiden name was you know storm so you know those things just popped into my mind okay a lot of it is just free association riffing, so. He had, yeah, skink. Um, uh, honest to say, no. I mean, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was thinking about, I was frankly thinking about, like, Goldfinger and Blofeld and Dr. No. I was thinking about James Bondian type. Like I was saying, you know, when I started out, just kind of creating him like that. But then when he went into the Florida rants, and stuff and uh i actually had uh and somebody told me this much later which i didn't you know i for whatever reason it might have been a blind spot but there was a uh, at the time the oldest living governor of florida and like the first republican governor since reconstruction claude kirk knew, i remember that it was i was six years old and it was 1967 he was elected or 60 66 was the election year and uh 
And I remember folks who voted for him, they're all excited. And then we had a mutual friend, and they said that, uh, you know, the, ex, the former governor likes your books. You know, could you sign one as a gift? To, you know, I can give him, you know, as a gift. And so I did. And then he, um, and so then he sent me a thank you letter. And so then I corresponded back. And, um, and, and then he sent me a letter saying, you know, and this is the former governor of Florida. And he said, and I said, you know, um, you know, I said, hey, if I'm ever over there, you know, whatever, you know, I'd like to meet you or whatever. And he goes, he goes, if you're ever over here, why don't we take like a surge road trip? We'll just get in the car. And <laughs> he said this. This is a governor. I'm like, holy cow, I saved that letter. So a couple years went by, and, and I hadn't talked to him. We just corresponded. And so I, there was a phone number there. And so I, I called it, and he answered. And I said, I said who I was, and da, da, da. And he was a great guy and everything. And, um, and I said, I got an idea. And I said, tell me if you're keen with this. Instead of coming over and taking a search road trip, how would you like to, like in a movie, because I think I write books cinematically, how would you like to have a cameo where you play yourself in the book? And he goes, that'd be great. And so we set up a, you know, a couple times. He came to Tampa uh, on a flight somewhere. And then I went over and we went out to his favorite fried chicken place. And we just talked about what would be in his role and everything. And so I put him in. And someone mentioned that that might that particular governor might have been the one that Carl was thinking about, which that was after mine came out and or whatever. I don't know. It, it, I think it's, it's very possible because he was hilarious. He would do. He, he was such a rebel, and this was long after he was governor. And I remember this, and I put this in the book, and I actually mentioned this to him, and he cracked up because I remember that. And and uh, what happened was. He was in court. He was a witness. It had nothing to do, but there was some lawsuit or something was happening. And um, the defendant's lawyer was F. Lee Bailey, right? I forget when this was. It was, like I said, mid-late 90s. And um, so they put him on the stand. And so they had to, like, swear him in and establish. And he goes, can you state your name for, you know, the record for the court stenographer? And he goes, uh, Claude Kirk. And he said, and what are you most known? This is F. Lee Bailey talking. He goes, what are you most known for? And he goes, Governor of Florida from 1967, 1971. And he goes, and what are you now? And he said, a has-been, just like you. <laughs> and, and, and I told him that. He cracked up, and he said, man, F. Lee Bailey's face turned all red. And everything. <laughs> but he was a hoot. And so I, so I had him, and I actually read this. He came to one event, and he had this, you know, he's a big, you know, uh, you know, character, somewhat larger than life, and he had this cowboy hat on, and his wife, and I said, I'm not going to say any word. Uh, the event starts at 7, show, walk in at, because I knew how the audience would be set, I said, walk in at 7.10 or 7.15. And so he showed up, because I have been talking about it, and uh, and then he came in, and he took over the event. Not, not, not that he was pushed his way, but, but his... His mind was so sharp, and he, I think he was probably 80, but it, and he was so funny, and he sat down up front, and I just kind of turned it to him, you know, and I did, you know, I did some readings, and I did this reading where he's riding along with Surgeon Cole, and what happens is his limos, he's, he's speaking at the Cultural Center in downtown West Palm Beach, you know, near where he lives, and the, uh, yeah, I'm riffing just off of that question about, um, so uh, his ride gets held up in traffic, and Serge is there talking to him about, and you know how Serge can be effervescent and charming, and it might take a while to. And so, so he's telling the governor, because oh man, I'm a huge supporter and everything. You know, I wish there were more you know politicians like you that cared about. Cause he did care about the environment and a lot of things, and and so, so he's talking to him, and he goes, "Can we give you a ride?" He goes, "No, my ride is going to show up." And then it gets hotter, and he takes off his cowboy hat, and finally he accepts a ride with Serge. Right? But make a long story short there. And so, because it's just getting so hot, so they're riding along, and the governor's in the back seat, and, and Serge, you know, say, what can we do to save Florida? And he goes, Coleman, you know, get on my notepad, take notes, you know, action item number one, right? And he goes, what can you do? And he goes, well, there's a lot of pesticide runoff from the sugarcane industry into the Everglades, right? And we had a long conversation about all the things that he cared about. So, so I, you know, Serge goes, you know, Coleman, item, item one, you know, uh, pesticide runoff, da, da, da. And so he tells me a number of these things, and so I, we did that, and that's the reading. And then finally, Serge says, uh, they're, of course, they're riding along, and he doesn't know who's with. And I did this in the reading. Uh, Serge like, glances back, and he goes, you know, Governor, you know, for, for all you've done for the state of Florida and all, you, all your love for the state of Florida, what can we possibly do to repay you? And he goes, well, there's one wish that I, and he said this to me, there's one wish that I, I, I have that I, I would hope, and, and that is to be buried on the Capitol grounds, you know. 
And so Serge goes, you know, Coleman, action item number 17, you know, bury the governor on the Capitol grounds. And Coleman goes, now? And he goes, no, you idiot. You know, after... He... <laughs> so, anyway. It really was an action list, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I love it. What are you doing um, for your next book? Can you give us a sneak preview? Uh, I, I have, I've got the actual, what I was telling you is like this guy who's, you know, just sort of a regular guy trips over something, he doesn't know what it means, but um, he's in some sort of a computer type data processing where he notices a pattern, and that's all I can say, because uh, that's the whole plot. But the, the Surgeon Coleman, they're going to, what Surgeon Coleman are going to do is they, they have to get fake IDs, right? And then they're like, like then the guy goes, why do you want to be older? And it's like, <laughs> because he basically he tells Coleman he goes you know the time's coming so let's get you know we want to get this right and so they they go into practice retirement and they go to these communities and they and they, they have but no it's if you know these communities in Florida they're they're a hoot the, the stereotypes and the cliches are not true at all that's why I came up with the E team and the G unit you know those, those old women that are a hoot you know and it's because well, there's like, there's this one place in Florida, I won't name it, but everybody in Florida knows it. It's the biggest, like, retirement community. They keep adding on sectors. And they, do you know the one I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's got the highest STD rate in the entire state of Florida. <laughs> yeah, so it's really? true. It's, it's a, I didn't who, know that. Yeah, and they came up with the name of a drink because, like, they have all these faux town squares, and they have band shells where people play and whatever, and there was... A couple of them got grabbed. They were, they were people were out strolling at night, and they found them like having sex in the band shell or or whatever. So they there's now this big popular drink, and she's like a local hero, and she, it's crazy. But you can you can read all about it. So same anyway, that's what Sergio Coleman are going to be doing. They're going to be they're going to have to get golf carts and three wheel bikes and stuff. Do you know I saw one going up 68th Street when I was driving into the store? Sometimes I'd turn off Scottsdale Road on Jackrabbit and then come down 68th Street to avoid all the Goldwater thing. And just coming up 68th as I'm heading towards Camelback was this guy in a golf cart, and he was, like, shifting and, you know, the whole bit. And I thought, amazing. Of course, Serge is going to figure out a way to jack up the uh, the golf cart and, and change the governor and the, and the, and the gear ratio mm -hmm. so he can really fly. And then he helps all the other retirees do the same thing. <laughs> So they're, they're all going 90. And Are you totally not to do with the books, but just because it came up the other night? What's going on with the reptile population? Is it is really out of control with the pythons and the whole bit, as it appears, or is that just local lore? Sure, why not? I mean, it's just, uh, no, it's um, we well, get the alligators, and like I remember that when they were allegedly endangered. They're not endangered. They're, I mean. It's it's amazing that we've got I don't know what the number is up now but it's it's well over a million and I mean they're everywhere I, I mean I see them no you just see them I mean it's like you know they're they're around um, and they're big <laughs> and but these Burmese pythons came in they're an invasive species and of course they took to the Everglades like because you know plenty of food source no natural predators and there's one famous picture which they've tried to figure out what happened but it was a smaller alligator, and both died. The the boa or or the Burmese python tried to eat the alligator, you know, head first, and it burst him in half because it was too big. And I guess the alligator, I don't know, fought or whatever. But but uh, it was classic, you know, which is you know these pythons are gotten so big that they're starting to eat the smaller alligators. You know, it was just and, and so they had the statewide. Um, they had a bounty, didn't they? They I had mean, a bounty, yeah. and they had a statewide hunt to like try to get the numbers down. And it was, of course, in Florida, it was a fiasco. It was like, no, the entire state. There's supposed to be this overpopulation of, you know, crazy, you know, Hermes pythons. And, like, they had this whole thing, and they only got 67. You know, uh, there's millions, you know, it's crazy. But the thing was, do you remember, like, at Jaws, when they had that bounty for the shark, and everybody shows up, you know, down at the dock, you know, with axes and shotguns and baseball bats. Nothing to do with fishing, right? Just all this crazy. It's like everybody went down to, like, the Everglades with baseball bats, you know, trying to, you know, knowing nothing about Burmese pythons. And so that's why. So, yeah, it's still a problem because 67 is 67 is my neighborhood, you know, so. 
why? You know, it's, it would. No, it would. Uh, that would. Uh, that would defeat the purpose. You clearly had an absolutely wonderful time doing this, and it's clear that all of you it really loved them, and here you are. So why don't we give Tim a round of applause and thank him for coming to see us? Thank you. It's really been lovely. I hope it won't be 15 years before you return. It, it wasn't. This Triggerfish Twist, I came after that, because I remember Did that was you? my first stop, and a subsequent book. I don't know how much later, but I know that I was here after Triggerfish. I forget which one it was. Well, obviously I did too. Well, but no, nevertheless, I'll we'd have, love to I'll, have you back. I'll have to look it up. No, because I remember mm -hmm. both were great events, and so. But yeah, I'd love to. Well, you have you have loads of fans here, and they're Thank I'm you. sure delighted to have this opportunity to spend some time with you. Um, Tim, would you prefer to? We can move your chair over there to that wooden I table. I stand over there. Or I'm trying to remember what we did with the glass table, which in theory you were going to stand at, but I don't know where it went. Jeffrey, are you here? Let me get a group picture if I could. Sure. Form a group in the store, and I'll get the several times so like at, at the beginning a lot of people were really great and then by the time the final flash was like this so. you know what that cheer you remember Monty Python and the Holy Grail and there was much rejoicing yeah. 